round two FY24 PACE grant recipients. Uh, the hope today is to introduce you guys to the program, make sure that you guys understand all of the requirements, go over our monthly activity and expenditure report user guides so that we can provide those to you and so that you're prepared uh, when it comes to uh, starting those reports on August 1st, which is, is going to be here shortly. Um, initially, uh, we'll go through all of this information. Uh, at the end, we'll have a question and answer time. Please feel free to put anything you want in the chat at any time. You don't have to wait until the end to put it in the chat. We'll go through the chat and, and, and read out loud the questions that are in the chat and answer them at that time. Um, no need for a roll call or anything like that. Everybody here will get to know each other as time goes forward, and there's a lot of us here. Um, but at the end of the day, my name is Bill Sarbuck. I am the supervisor within the um, New Jersey Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Uh, we oversee all grants related to pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship. Uh, this PACE pre-apprenticeship grant um, is our second round of PACE. We did do two rounds of PACE in fiscal year 24. Um, we anticipate doing an additional two rounds probably in fiscal year 25. Just to throw out an answer to this question, because I'm sure somebody will ask it. Uh, as a recipient of round two of PACE, you will not be eligible to apply for round one of PACE this fiscal year. Once round two becomes available, you would be eligible if any of you are interested in applying for that grant grant opportunity. Um, you'll be able to pay attention to the notice of grant opportunities when they become available. I would anticipate right now, if I was to guess, our round one pace for uh, FY25, which started on July 1st, will probably become available somewhere towards the end of October, beginning of November. And our round two will probably become available somewhere between January and February. Um, obviously, there is a chance that those requirements could change and you may not be eligible to apply for the full fiscal year, but as of right now, I don't anticipate that being the case. It doesn't mean you can't apply and receive this grant again in the future. You would just have to wait until next July when our opportunities for FY26 become available if the decision in the building was made to not allow uh, grantees to apply within the next fiscal year um, because your contract obviously will still be active. So um, that, like I said, you can pay attention for the NGOs and ask those questions when they become available. Um, but usually we put right in the notice of grant opportunity what the allowability is. So just give you guys that heads up um, so we don't have to answer that question at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to start start our presentation and we will like i said get to questions and answers at the end we are recording this session so um just know that anything you say or do will be used against no i'm joking it's not this is not a legal situation um but no at the end of the day we are recording it we will share it with you so that you can share it with any staff members who weren't able to attend today uh we'll also be sharing it with you so that you can refer back to it if you ever have to um while you're um, uh, moving forward with your grant. So, as I said before, my name is Bill Sarbuck. I'm the supervisor here in our Office of Apprenticeship. I have some staff with us today, uh, Lauren Kremper DiFilippo, who is our contract administrator and uh, gonna be your technical assistant for this grant period moving forward. Uh, and the PACE grant, um, Heather Wilson, who, is uh, another contract administrator with our unit. She will be responsible for reviewing your monthly activity and expenditure reports when they get submitted that we're going to get into here in a few minutes. Uh, Al Nixon is also with us. He's a contract administrator who oversees our uh, registered apprenticeship program, our GAINS grant. Um, and then uh, Tammy Novatin, who's not with us today, she's out today, but she uh, also works with us and she works uh, pretty closely with all of the grants that we offer here within our um, Office of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. So the grantees, the recipients, so all of you here are listed in your company name, the occupations in which you're training in, and the total number of participants that you are contracted to serve. Uh, are listed. 
one of the requirements of all of our participants is that they get registered with the One Stop Career Center. So, oh, I went backwards. Sorry. So obviously we can have you forward all these participants over to the one stop to get registered, which doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. So what we do is we ask you to have all of your participants log on to this jobsource.nj.gov web address, create a free account. When they do that, that will register them with the one stop career center and it'll allow for them to then utilize um, the one stop resources that are available become knowledgeable about them right here on this website under the tool section. It, it, it has a lot of information that will help them and also um, make sure that the one stop is, is aware of uh, anything that they're receiving and any types of services that they're receiving through our programs. So um, ultimately, you'd have to have all of your participants uh, come to this job source website, click to create a free account, register for the database, which will then register for them for the one stop. And um, and then if they have any additional needs or interest in going to the one stop, they'll already be registered when they go there and they won't have to re register. They might ask them to update any data that is is has changed. But beyond that, uh, that won't be necessary. This is also a good place for you guys to utilize some of the tools that could be helpful for um, work readiness. So helping them with writing a resume, creating those cover letters, um, making a reference list. You know, there's a lot of stuff here, uh, how to fill out a job application. All those things are here and it's something you can take a look at, maybe pull some data from these to use when you're doing those workforce readiness um, and preparation trainings with, with your participants. Now I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague Lauren Kremper de Filippo, who's going to talk a little bit more about the PACE program. Uh, so Lauren, I'll hand it over to you now. If you're talking, you're muted. And let me unmute myself. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the goals of the PACE program is to create a pipeline of qualified individuals and enable them to transition into sustainable career pathways. We want to present opportunities to underrepresented and or disadvantaged populations, to drive economic development through skills and educational attainment, and to promote the value of pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship programs. And that's a key bullet that last bullet just so you um something to always keep in mind with your programs is those connections with registered apprenticeship were mandatory for the application and now they will be mandatory for you to meet the requirements of that notice of grant opportunity because at the end of the day if your program is not a pre-apprenticeship program leading these individuals to apprenticeship in some capacity that, that then it's not really meeting the requirements of a pace grant so um always pay attention to the, what it is you're you're um, emphasizing within the program and and what your trainings are emphasizing so that they are promoting uh, the usage of pre-apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship program and models because that's what these programs are meant to do. So the responsibilities and expected outcomes as a grantee, you're to enroll a minimum number of participants in your pre-apprenticeship program as outlined in your proposal. Ensure that 80% of the participants graduate and are placed in one of the following. 25% into a US DOL approved registered apprenticeship program, into post-secondary education and or employment at a rate of no lo lower than $16 per hour. And that's a quality employment placement. Maintain records and report program activities on a monthly basis and provide follow-up support services to your participants. So that second listing here sometimes gets confusing. Um, just think of it as if you're training 10 individuals, if you're contracted to enroll 10 participants, eight of them have to complete the pre-apprenticeship training. And of those eight, you have to place 25% um, of them um, into uh, registered apprenticeship. 
the uh, the rest of those participants would then go into either post secondary education or get a job at sixteen dollars an hour. Your deliverable dates, the contract period started on June 15th and it'll go through December 31st, 2025. Your activity and expenditure reports are due by the 15th of every month. And by the end of the contract period, the minimum number of participants must have completed the program and acquired a quality placement. And back to Bill. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as as Lauren said there, you know, we we are. Um, uh, you know, we ha we give you an 18 month period to, pr to provide that pre apprenticeship and complete that pre apprenticeship training. But the expectation is that those quality outcomes, those placements into registered apprenticeship and employment will also occur in that 18 month period. So you want to make sure that your pre apprenticeship training program is going to start as soon as possible so that you give your participants the most opportunity and yourselves the most opportunity to complete those trainings and then make those partnerships and placements into um, those outcomes as defined on the earlier slide. So I'm actually going to switch over to a different slideshow now. And this will be our activity and expenditure reports. This is a user guide. It's going to walk you through step by step how to start and submit complete and submit both an activity report and an expenditure report. As we said um, on the last slide, you have to do one on a monthly basis. They are due by the 15th of every month. And your first report will actually be a June and July report combined. Since we grant started in the middle of June, we're not going to ask you to do a 15 day June report. That doesn't make sense. So we'll have you do uh, a June and July report combined as a July report, and it'll be due by August 15th. You won't actually be able to open it and start it until August 1st. So you got about a week to prepare to get these reports done. We'll get these user guides out to you after this presentation, um, along with the uh, with the PowerPoint that we just went over um, on the other uh, other slide deck. But these will be provided to you shortly and you can use utilize these starting on August 1st to um, start your reports and get them completed and submitted to us. It is allowable to not get your reports submitted by the 15th of every month. It is not OK if you don't notify us that you're having a reason of what the reasoning is, and it's not OK if you don't um, inform us of a date in which you can anticipate being able to get it submitted to us. Please don't force us to babysit your organizations and bother you over and over again on a monthly basis to get your reports submitted. Um, if you submit them by the 15th of the month and we review them and we send them back to you for edits, please make sure you get those edits completed and submit it back to us in a timely manner. Uh, the main reason I bring this up to you is you have to remember you have to do these reports every single month. Heather, who is the one who's going to review your, your reports, are reviewing your reports along with everybody else's reports, and that's not just those that are on this call right now. That's all of our active grants, and we have anywhere from 80 to 100 active grants at any time. So she's responsible for reviewing and approving 80 activity reports and 80 expenditure reports, and I'm making that number up because I don't know it off the top of my head, but it could be more than 80. So it's a lot, and it's it's hard to stay on top of it, and the expectation here is that your organization is going to stay on top of yourselves, uh, not needing us to constantly badger you and inform you that you haven't submitted your reports. So please stay on top of getting those reports submitted to us by the 15th of the month. And if you're, there's a reason why you need additional time, make sure you reach out to Lauren, let her know, reach out to Heather and let her know, copy them both. Um, and that way they can, uh, one, make note of it, and two, not bother you when they start looking through and see that they don't have your reports. Um, I will tell you that in the past we haven't used getting reports submitted to us timely as a performance measure. 
but my anticipation is that we will start using it as a performance measure moving forward, which basically means that it could negatively impact your ability to receive future funding if you're not getting those reports in on time. The main reasoning is it just gets really hard for us to track and pay attention to everything that you guys are trying to accomplish um, without getting these reports timely, and uh, we can't fall behind on that kind of stuff because when you fall behind, it really throws everything else for a loop. If we have somebody who's two, three months behind on their reporting, but they're the only ones, uh, you know, you can imagine how that could make things a little difficult from a um, a tracking standpoint, because we're trying to track your grants, make sure they're in line with meeting the outcomes by the end of our grant period, scheduling conference calls with you guys and and monitoring and, and, and uh, auditing of, of grants, you know, all that stuff has to happen on a monthly basis uh, throughout your 18 month grant period. I'd hate for somebody to have to come out and really monitor you guys because you're not getting your reports submitted timely and we don't know where your grants at right now. Uh, I'd rather it be um, something that you can stay on top of on your own and, and we can work together to um, give that extra time if it's necessary, but uh, make sure that you're keeping us in the loop. So with all that, uh, I'll then move into the actual starting of the reports and the submittal of the reports. So just like you do when you were filling out the applications and completing the contracts, you'll have to log in to the web address njdol.intelligrants.com. You'll use the same username and passwords that you utilized for those other processes. Once you utilize them, once you enter them, you'll click the login button and that'll bring you into the database. If for some reason you're not registered or you have a new staff person that needs to get registered, there is a, a new user button that can be clicked on right under the login. Make sure that once that person gets registered, you, organ, you, re, you reach out to Lauren and the team so that we can approve their registration and add them to your application so that you can, they can start seeing everything the same way you can. In order to locate your application, there's a couple of ways that you might have to do this. Initially, right now, because you guys completed your contracts, but they've not been signed off by our commissioner yet, they've been submitted, but they haven't been signed off yet, you won't find them in your My Tasks. So if you logged in right now to your IGX database in your My Tasks, you would not see your grant right now. Um, but once our contracts do get signed off on by the commissioner, that it will be listed under my tasks, as you see here. Um, until then, you'll have to use the search searches button on the top next to home. When you click on searches, it'll pull up a search of your documents. You'll choose the drop down on type and you'll find PACE application 2024 round two. That's your application period. Once you click on once you click on round two, you'll click search and it'll pull up under documents your application. You can then click on the name under name and that will bring you into your application. Just like when you were filling out your application or looking at your contract pages, it brings you into the application document landing page. In order to start your activity reports, you'll scroll all the way down in the blue menu on the on the left and find related documents. Under related documents, you'll click initiate related documents. That will pull up this drop this additional tab. Right now, if you went there and clicked on initiate related documents, it would tell you you have no you have no available related documents because like I said, they're not available till August 1st. As of August 1st, when you come in here, you'll see that this box will pop up. You'll choose the drop down for available documents and you'll look, look for PACE Activity Report July 2024, because that's going to be the first report that you're doing for us. It's probably going to be the only activity report that's listed in, in there. But just so you know, that's what you'll be looking for. PACE Activity Report July 2024. Once that comes up, you'll click Create and it will create the report. Uh, the report. Uh, first page that you'll have to do is you'll have to agree that you wanted to start this. So you'll want to make sure that you're paying attention to that description and make sure it says PACE Activity Report July 2024. If it doesn't say that, then decline, go back and look through the list and make sure you're choosing the right report. If it does, then click Agree, and it'll bring you actually right into the activity report. 
So you'll notice that the forms that are listed on the activity report are different from the application. They're not going to look the same. They're not going to be named the same. These are going to be specific just to the activity report. When you get, come into this page, you'll see them all listed here under activity report, participant list, quality partner, quality placement and activity, stipends page and dashboard. Uh, initially, if you don't have any participants, you do not need to save the participant list or the quality placement and activity pages. You can just go to the dashboard, complete the dashboard page, save that page, and then you can submit your reports. If you have participants that have started in your June or July months, you will start by completing the participant list page and move down through the other pages. We'll get into those pages here in a little more detail in a second, but I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that you do not need to go to these pages and save them. If you have no participants, if you have no quality partners, if you have no stipend recipients, do not just go to these pages and click save. If you do, it could cause the other pages to automatically do things and that's not what you want so only click on these pages and enter them if you actually have a participant if you actually have a quality partner that you want to enter if you actually have a recipient of a stipend um, once this report's initiated when you go back to your dashboard or log in for the first time this report will show up in your my tasks it'll show up in there until you submit it to us for review once you submit it to us for review it's no longer in a status where it needs you to do some work on it so it's not considered your task it's considered our task so it will no longer show up in your my tasks but you can find it by utilizing the searches or going into your application and scrolling down to the bottom. You'll see under the related uh, documents, you'll see all of your previous month's reports there as well. So you can do these pages in any order that you wish, but we, we usually suggest that you start with the participant list page. <clears throat> the participant list page is, is like I said, it's where you're going to list the information about all of your participants. This is what the participant list page looks like. You'll enter the um, If you have an OSOS number for them, you enter it. If you don't, it is not a mandatory field. It's the only non-mandatory field on this page. All the other fields are mandatory. The cycle number, you'll choose the cycle number based on which cycle they're and which training they're going to participate in. This will correlate to your uh, deliverables page within your application. So you broke down your cycles on your deliverables page, look back at it and, and compare and make sure you're putting these participants into proper cycles. You'll enter their date of birth, gender, race, ethnicity, and highest level of education. Please provide all of this information. Uh, we utilize this information to provide demographic data on our participants to both the legislation, legislator, legislators, as well as our commissioners and um, the governor's office. It allows for us to best understand the populations that are in need. It also allows for us to better understand who services are being provided to in communities, uh, especially if we're providing them in specific communities throughout the state. So if we're trying to break, break it down by county, you know, we can show those county legislators how many women, how many minorities, how many high school graduates or under or, or or college students that we might have served it really helps us to provide that information so although there might be a designation of not disclosed we prefer that you do not utilize that as much as possible and you gather this information for all of your participants so that it allows for us to best understand and be able to track and report on who's being served with our program funds once you've entered the first participant if you have additional participants to add, you'll click the plus sign. Do not click add at the top of the page. When you click add, it automatically creates a whole new page. I don't want to have 50 pages with one participant on each page. Please use the plus sign next to them and enter the person underneath um, and save the page regularly through filling out this application, uh, filling out the participant list. Um, if you only have one participant to start, you only enter one here and you save it. If you have 10, then you can put 10 on this page, save the page, and then you can move on to the next step. <clears throat> that next page being the quality partner page 
is where you're going to list any quality partners. A quality partner is, is somebody who you are going to place these individuals with. So it's either a registered apprenticeship program, an employer, or a post-secondary education provider. That drop down under quality partner type will give you those three options. You'll choose which one they are. You'll list who that quality partner is. That's the name of the organization. <clears throat> You'll provide us with their FEIN number. It is not mandatory that we have their FEIN number for this to save, but um, we ask that you give it, get it for us if, if you can and provide it to us. Uh, it allows for us to best uh, kind of track who and where people are moving to provide the contact person at the quality partner agency and their contact information. Uh, all of this is in case we have a need or if the governor is going out and wants to meet with employers, you know, sometimes there might be a reason why we want to reach out to these quality partners. Usually we wouldn't do that without reaching out to you guys and notifying you of it as well so that you can give them that information. But ultimately um, this allows for us to track and make sure that your placements are, are, um, are accurate and that they actually occur and that they're um, and who they're with and what types of placements those are. Same as with the place uh, participant list page, there's a plus sign at the end. If you have additional quality partners to list, you'll click that plus sign and enter them on this page. You do not need to use the add button unless there's no longer any plus signs at the end. Um, another good hint and good tip for you is to not delete participants from these pages um, you can delete partners from the page in some capacities, but don't delete participants from the participant list page unless you reach out to us and, and, and talk to us first. We may want to do it on our end rather than you doing it because sometimes deleting people causes other issues. Um, so just be careful when you're deleting anybody. In order to delete somebody off a page, once you click this plus sign and then add a second participant, there'll be a plus and a minus sign next to all these individuals. That minus sign will delete that person or that quality partner off the list. That's how you delete individuals or delete partners. Um, but like I said, it's suggested to you that you reach out to us and don't do those deletions yourself and don't move people around on the pages. If you put somebody in, leave them where they're at and move to the next person and always make sure you're adding people to the bottom of the list. There'll be a plus sign ne next to all of these quality partners or next to all of your participants on your participant list. It's always best to go all the way to the bottom of your list, click the plus sign and enter all of your new participants underneath the ones that were already there. Same here on your quality partner page. Go down to the bottom of your quality partner page, a partner type list and uh, click the plus sign there rather than clicking it in the middle and entering them throughout. It's just it's a database. It has its quirks and sometimes those things cause issues. So just some points of reference for you. Once again, make sure you're saving the page while you're going through the process of entering this information so that you don't lose any data at any time. Once you've entered your participants, you'll notice that a check mark goes in that box next to the participant list. That tells you that those participants participant list page has been completed. Like I said, if you don't have any participants and you save that page, it'll put a check mark in that box. <clears throat> you do not want to do that because it'll automatically create a quality placement and activity page for any participants that you enter on your participant list page. So if you go to that participant list page and click save, but there's no participants, it'll create a blank quality placement and activity page that will require us to go in and delete those pages for you, which isn't a lot of work, but it's something that you want to try and avoid because it's ultimately extra um, you have to let notify us we have to go in and do it and and it ultimately could affect next month's report which is what we're trying to avoid all of these reports when you complete them will automatically populate next month's report with the same data and so that you're just adding new information to it in the in the uh the future months rather than having to retype in the same information over and over again that would be ridiculous and silly so you want to make sure that this month's report's accurate and 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 doesn't have additional information or isn't missing any information <clears throat> so that when you start next month's report it's it's clean and now you're just adding new information to it if that makes sense so once uh 
you've completed entering your participants and your quality partners, the quality placement and activity pages will automatically populate here. You'll see that arrow next to it. And when you hover over that arrow, it'll pull up all of the names of participants that you've already created. You'll have to click on each individual initially in the first month, and you'll have to go to their quality placement pages and complete some pages. Anytime you add a new participant, you're going to have to go to each one of those quality placement pages and add additional information onto the page. Once they, you move to the next month, you'll only have to update their pages if they have additional details that need to go on the quality placement and activity page. This is what the quality placement activity page looks like. It'll automatically populate with the participant's name and their unique ID number. You'll choose the drop down for participant progress, which is going to be satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Um, You'll enter their program enrollment date. Do not enter their program completion date until they've completed the training. That's the pre apprenticeship training program. That's not placement. That just means they've completed the training, the pre apprenticeship training. If for some reason they don't complete the training, but they've left, you'll choose an exit reason and that'll basically put them down as not completing the training. Once you have participants who have completed the training and now have have reached the time of having a quality outcome. You'll choose the type of quality outcome under the drop down that you see in red on the page. You'll choose either registered apprenticeship, employment or post secondary education. Um, and what will happen is underneath quality partner, a new drop down will pull up and any of your quality partners on your quality partner page that correlate to that type of quality outcome. So any of the registered apprenticeship quality outcomes partners, any of the employment quality outcome partners or any of the post secondary quality outcome partners will, will show up in that drop down under quality partner. You'll choose that organization's name based on what you entered on your quality uh, partner page. You'll enter their NAICS code. If you don't know what that is, you can just Google it. Just look up the um, occupation code for the uh, type of job that they're placing them in. You'll choose the trade or occupation that that, that, that um, quality outcome is in. You'll enter a previous hourly wage if it's entering them in. Uh, and that previous hourly wage will be what they were receiving prior to being in your training in their most recent job. So if they were working for example, as a as a janitor in their previous job making $10 an hour, you would enter $10 an hour in their previous hourly wage. In their starting hourly wage, you'd enter what their new salary start, starting hourly wage is um, to show the difference between what they were receiving prior to the training and now what they're receiving. Um, obviously, you don't have to enter a, a, any hourly wages if the person's outcome isn't employment or registered apprenticeship because a registered apprenticeship should be a job as well. Um, if they're a registered apprenticeship, you'll enter the status of the apprentice with USDOL. That's going to be um, satisfactory or unsatisfactory as well. Um, the I think it's like satisfactory canceled. Uh, there's a couple of dropped in that drop down. Uh, but you'll choose the appropriate one based on where they're at in their registered apprenticeship. Um, and you'll enter the date of uh, the registered apprenticeship cancellation only if they you choose canceled in the status of apprentice apprenticeship with USDOL. You'll only enter the date of apprenticeship completion with USDOL if the status is completed. If that makes sense, hopefully that's clear. But if you have any questions, let put it in the chat and we'll we'll reference back to that. But based on the statuses that are under status of apprentice with USDOL, if you choose canceled, you enter a cancellation date. If you choose completed, then you enter completion date. Those are the only times that you fill in those last two bullet, uh, two boxes under quality partner information. And you should only be filling out those last three boxes if the type of quality outcome is registered apprenticeship. If your participants receive any credentials while they're in your program, uh, this is where you'll list them under credential information. You'll provide us with the type of credential, the number of hours for the training, and when they receive the credential. The plus sign next to it will allow you to enter multiple credentials. So if they receive three, four, five, then you can list all five of them here. If any of your participants receive any college credits, you would put that under college credit information. 
provide us with all the details that are listed here and use the plus sign in order to add additional um, college credits that may be offered or uh, received by your participants. You'll enter this information for all of your participants on a monthly basis. Initially, when you first enter your participants into the program though, the only thing you'll probably be entering is their participant progress and their enrollment date. Uh, that's usually what you're going to do in the first month of participants when they first get added to your participant list page. Uh, and then as time goes forward, you'll start, add, start adding all the additional information. You should be entering the information within this page when these things actually occur. So if you have a participant who gets a quality outcome in August, the quality outcome should be listed on your August report. If somebody receives a credential in October, it should be listed on the October report um, and then it'll it'll follow moving forward to each month. It'll show you all of this data, but you want it to show these things when they actually occur. You don't want to put in that somebody got a quality placement um, in 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 September, but it's only August. That doesn't make sense. Hopefully that is clear. Once again, when you've entered all the information necessary for this participant, you'll click save and you can move to the next quality placement and activity page and complete that the same way you completed this one. The next page is our stipend recipients page. A lot of you had budgeted within your budgets uh, to provide stipends to your participants. This is where you'll track those stipends. So there's two things that you'll need to track on this stipend recipients page. One is you'll you'll track the monthly stipend cost, which is that stipend cost column. The other thing you'll have to track is your expenses year to date, which is the cumulative cost. You only enter your participants on this page one time. It will pull forward to the previous to the next month. Um, you'll choose on the drop down of the name the participant in which received the stipend. You'll enter for in the stipend cost column the amount of stipend they received this month only. And the cumulative cost will be pulling forward from all the previous months any stipends that you've already issued to them. At, at um, any time we should be able to come in here and you should be able to come in here and add the stipend cost and the cumulative cost together and that should be how much that participants received in stipends through the end of that month. So if you're doing your July report, any stipends that were received by your participants from June 15th to July 31st, that's what we should be able to do in order to find that out. You'll obviously check the stipend received box for each of these participants. Since we are a reimbursement model, there should be no times when you don't have a, that you have a participant stipend listed here that they didn't receive the actual funds for yet. Remember, you have to, pay them for up front and then we reimburse you for anything you've paid. That's how our programs work. Once again, if you would need to add additional stipend recipients onto the page, you'll click the plus sign and it'll add a new name. If somebody's already on this list, please don't try and add their name again. It will give you an error and it won't let you do it. Um, but ultimately, always make sure that those totals at the bottom, the stipend cost column matches your monthly expenditure report for stipends and the cumulative cost matches the expenses to date on your active on your expenditure report. We'll get into the expenditure reports in a couple of minutes, but those are things to just keep in mind and to pay attention to. The last required page of your activity report is your dashboard. Like I said, if you have a time when there's no participants, especially in your first month or your first couple of months of your grant, and you haven't started your pre-apprenticeship training program, this will be the only page that you must complete. A lot of the data on this page automatically pulls in from the previous pages that you've completed, so you want to do those first. But if there are no participants, you'll come to this page, you'll enter the, print, the project director's name, you'll, pro, you'll type in the program status comment, which will provide us with some details on where your program is, what you're doing next, when your expectation of adding participants is, when your class of pre-apprentices is going to start, any of that kind of detail. You want to make sure you provide us with as much detail as you can within that program status co comments so that we're not reaching out to you to ask additional questions. We can look at that and, and garner the information necessary in order to know where your program is at any time. 
the demographics data pulls from the participant list page. That's why I was telling you we would like for it to not have people and not disclosed. It breaks down all this information for us. And then uh, the next section is the program activity and outcomes. That'll list your cycles and how many participants are in it. That'll pull in the achievement column. You'll have to enter a start and end date of that cycle. You can enter the end, enter the end date of the cycle right up front because you're going to know how long that training is going to be. So if it's a three month training, you'll put your start date as July 1st and your end date as uh, September 30th. I'm making up these dates, but ultimately that would show your three month training. In the comments section, you'll provide comments on the course uh, description of the course and any updates to the activities that were received during the reporting month. That information should be entered on a monthly basis for each of the cycles that have participants in them. Um, once your participants start completing, there's additional fields on this page on this dashboard that need to be uh, that will automatically populate with data from the quality placement and activity pages. You can enter, you'll have to enter comments next to all of those that have numbers in them. So if somebody got uh, into a registered apprenticeship program, you'll enter comments in the comments section next to the number of participants in a registered apprenticeship um, so that we can be aware of where that participant is and if they're having any difficulties. Uh, once you've completed entering any comments and uh, and reviewing this page for accuracy, you'll save the page and you'll be com uh, you'll be finished with it. If for some reason you find any incorrect information on this page, sometimes you'll have to go back and check the other pages that correlate to this page. So either the participant list page to make sure you didn't forget to save the page and 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 the person never got added, or to the quality placement page where you might need to update information on some of your participants. Otherwise, if you come to this page and there's incorrect data on it, you need to notify us and we can reach out to our vendor and see if it's maybe a database error. But always make sure you're saving this page uh, when you're done reviewing it uh, and saving it as often as possible when you enter any data. The last step you'll want to take before submitting your report is the document validation. Just like with the application, you'll scroll down to the tools section in the left side menu and find document validation. You'll click on it and it'll pull up any pages that have errors on them. If there aren't any errors, this page will it'll tell you there aren't any and you can move to the next step. If there are any errors, then you click on the pages. It'll bring you back to where those errors are and, and you have to fix them before you can submit your report. If you do not fix the pages that have errors, it will not let you submit your report. Last step is submitting your report. You'll scroll down to say on the same left side menu to status options and choose activity report submitted. When you choose that, it'll pull up this text box asking if you're sure you want to submit it. You'll click OK and that'll submit your activity report and you'll be done with that month's activity report. Um, if for some reason you're not sure if you want to, you can click cancel and go back and check anything that you need to check, but make sure you click OK and you do the status option change to status activity report submitted so that it can be submitted to us for review and approval. Um, just so you know, no expenditure reports will ever be reviewed and approved without your activity report being submitted as well. So please don't submit your expenditure reports uh, and then wait three days to submit your activity reports because that's what's going to happen is that expenditure report is just going to sit there and wait for your activity report to be submitted anyway. Try and submit them at the same time or similar times or submit the activity report up front and then they'll sub then submit your expenditure report secondarily. It's really up to you which way you want to do it, but just know they review them simultaneously to ensure that they are um, tracking your activities to make sure it matches what your expenditures are. Once the activity report is completed, um, you must then start and submit your expenditure report. Uh, if you have zero expenses to report in the month, you still have to submit an expenditure report. We'll get into all the processes of what you need to complete on the expenditure reports here in a second, but the initial step for starting the expenditure report will be to log in to the database, 
go into your application and whether you're in your application or you're in the activity report, you can scroll down to the bottom and find related documents. In that related documents section, you'll click initiate related documents, which is what you did for the activity report. And that'll pull up that initiate related documents tab once again. Uh, as I said earlier, if it's not August 1st, this will tell you you have no available act, uh, reports to uh, no available related documents to start. As of August 1st, this will pull up and you can choose the drop down under available documents and you should see a PACE expenditure report July 2024. Remember, you're combining June and July's reports and submitting them by August 15th. From August 1st to August 15th is when you when the report is available to you to start. Um, if for some reason you come in here and the available documents section does not provide you with an expenditure report or an activity report, notify us and we'll check into it and see what's going on. Always remember that you're starting the report for services you provided last month. So if it's August 1st, you're always starting a July report. If it's September 5th, you're always starting an August report. You're never starting an August report in August. You're never starting a September report in September. Whatever the date is, you're starting the report for the previous month. Hopefully that is clear because that does sometimes cause issues, <clears throat> especially if you're behind on getting your reports submitted timely, which is another reason why we like to have them submitted uh, as fast and as early as possible so that we can review them, approve them and move to the next month. Once you've chosen that PACE expenditure report July 2024, you'll click the create button. And it'll bring you to that agreement page once again. Same thing, check the description, make sure it says PACE expenditure report July 2024 and click agree. When you do that, it'll bring you into your expenditure report, just like the activity report brought you right into the activity report. This will bring you right into the expenditure report. You'll notice there are just a few forms that need to be completed for it. The first one that you'll click on is the PACE expenditure report. This is what it looks like. It'll pull in the cost categories and the approved grant amounts from your cost summary within your application. This is why we had to review those, make sure they were accurate and update your budgets um, accordingly. If for some reason there's a budget modification that you need to make and, and you don't want to submit a report prior to that, make sure you let us know before you start this report because there is a process for getting budget modifications reviewed, approved, and updated in the database. But initially when you come in, you'll start the reports. You'll click on this PACE expenditure report. You'll see the approved grant amounts and the cost categories that you budgeted for. The only thing you'll have to fill out on a monthly basis is the current expenses column of this page. So if you have any current expenses in any of the cost categories that you have budgeted funds for, you'll enter it for this month. You'll save the page. You'll make sure that your available balances are not negative. If they are, then you've obviously entered something incorrectly. Um, and you'll move on to the next step. If you have no expenses in the first month, you'll leave the zeros in the current expenses column. You'll save the page and you'll move to the next step. Once you move forward and your grants um, had a couple months worth of billing submitted and approved, the previous month's expenses will show up in the amount expended to date column. It'll automatically populate. You want to make sure that looks accurate so that your current expenses plus your amount expended to date minus your approved grant amount equals the available balance. You always want to make sure available balance is matching your records just in case there's a database issue. You can notify us and we can look into it. We have had some issues more recently with the amount expended to date column having some works. We usually catch them on our side uh, and have them corrected, but if you catch them and let us know, that would also obviously be helpful as well. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. It's only happened a few, but I, um, I try to be as transparent with you guys as I can at all times. Always make sure that you're entering this information, verifying the information looks accurate, saving the page, and notifying us whenever you see anything that you're not quite sure whether or not it's right or not. 
once you've completed entering your current expenses and save the page, you'll um, move to the next step. The next step is your miscellaneous attachments page. Um, this page is not mandatory. It's where you will go to provide any supporting documentation. If you'd like to include it with your report, we do not require you to provide us that information on a monthly basis, but some people like to have it there for tracking purposes for their own internal uh, monitoring and auditing of, of their grants. That is perfectly fine for you to use it for that purpose. This will also be where you'll provide any additional documentation if for some reason we ask you for it. So if you bill us for something and we want to see proof of the expenses, we'll ask you to put it in the miscellaneous attachments page and, and this is where you'll do it. Um, just like was the case in um, the application, once you enter the description and choose the drop down and save this page, a plus sign will show up next to that description. You'll click that plus sign to add additional mis miscellaneous attachments. Please do not once again use the add button at the top unless you've got no more plus signs available to you on the page. Um, but ultimately, like I said, this is not a mandatory page. You can submit this report without entering any miscellaneous attachments. The final page that you need to complete on a monthly basis for your expenditure reports are your is your payment voucher. What you'll do is you'll come to this payment voucher after you've completed the expenditure report page. Make sure the total amount matches what you've billed for the month. Check the declaration checkbox um, saying that you certify the payment voucher is correct and that all particulars um, are, are accurate and you'll save this page. Once you've checked that box, save this page, the next step will be uh, doing a document validation like we did on the activity report. You can do that by scrolling to tools, finding document validation, clicking on it, and it'll check and make sure you don't have any errors on the pages. If it does, click on the pages and go back to them and clear the errors. If it doesn't, then you can move to the final step, which is uh, submitting your expenditure report. In order to submit your expenditure report, just like you did with the activity report, you'll scroll down the status options and you'll choose the status expenditure report submitted review required. The reason it says that is that we have to review it. Once you've submitted it, you'll click that. It'll bring up this text box asking if you agree uh, to change the status. You'll click OK and that'll submit your expenditure report. At this point, you'll be done submitting both your activity and your expenditure reports and then we'll review them and if there's any issues and edits necessary we'll send it back to you and notify you of next steps uh, like i said if we send them back to you for edit please get them back to us in a timely manner i will ask the team to give you a due date when they submit them back to you so that you'll know when we expect them back moving forward um, uh, and that way we can try and track and keep you on task with getting those reports submitted and we don't fall behind for future months reports because like I said it really does cause issues for yourself as well as us if you fall behind on a report and now next month's reports are a little screwy and the following month's reports are a little screwy it's not really fair to you or to the, us in the review of your grants to to have that happen so we'll try to work together as best as possible um, to make sure that doesn't happen obviously the earlier you get your reports submitted the better that gives us more time to review them and get it back to you if edits are necessary but you have until the 15th of every month to get both of these reports submitted and like i said it's expected that you'll get that activity report submitted to us before your expenditure report or submitted simultaneously basically the same at uh, during the same day all right i'm going to move back to our other power point like i said that user guide that we just went over we'll provide that to you after the fact um, so that you have it to use um, while you're completing and starting your reports so for any of you who need to reach out to usdol in order to get a registered apprenticeship program started or to ask any questions about starting a registered apprenticeship program here's the contact information for them uh, michael blatt is the state director for usdol uh, the federal representatives are broken down by county so you'll see the counties listed here uh, find the county in which your program is provided or a program is provided and reach out to the representative specific to that county and they can get back to you and answer any questions. Um, 
email addresses are all listed here so you can reach out to them directly and feel free to include us if there's ever a time where we could be helpful or they could uh, or we could work together in order to get things accomplished. And lastly, here's the contact, contact information for us here in the New Jersey Office of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. Uh, James Manning is the director of our Office of Apprenticeship and Business Services. Uh, he's not specifically working on our grants on a daily basis, but he is the overseer of all of our grants. I am the supervisor of all the grants within our Office of Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning, and that's my phone number and email. My phone number is listed here. I'll be honest with you. They put a new phone system in our building. It's not great. It doesn't work when we're not at our desks in our office. So I always suggest to please email me. Even if you email me and say, please call me and give me a phone number, that's perfectly fine. I don't mind talking to you on the phone. I just don't want you to wait on me or to think that you left me a voicemail that I don't even have access to get to because my voicemail doesn't work right now uh, since they did this new phone system. So uh, shoot me an email, give me a phone number if you need to talk. I don't mind calling you at any time. I just want to make sure that I don't keep you uh, waiting on me. And the other way to reach out to any of us is to use the apprenticeship unit at dol.nj.gov email address. That email address comes to all of us, including me. So we all get it simultaneously, and that way a response can be made to you uh, by any one of us in a timely manner so it doesn't hold you up and it hopefully gets you an answer faster than any of the other options. Um, but like I said, if you have a question and you need to get in touch with me, you can send it to the entire unit and I will get it as well. It come all I get all the apprenticeship unit emails as well as the rest of the team members. With that, I will open it up for questions. Do we have anything in the chat that you guys could read to me just because I don't, I can't open the chat right now where I'm at in my slideshows. There's nothing in the chat. All right. Does anybody have any questions? They want to um, unmute themselves and ask anything? Have any comments? Want to tell me that they got bored and fell asleep? Whatever you'd like. Hey, Bill, this is Kim Raman from American Training Center. How are you doing, Kim? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for the Good. presentation. Super informative. I had one quick question. I can't remember the page it was on, but it was related to people, I believe, finishing their apprenticeship program. And it had a field that said, I think, apprenticeship completion. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to make sure I understood that. that so our apprenticeship program is one year long once they mm -hmm. start working. OK, and so I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that, that would be for people who during the grant period actually completed their whole apprenticeship with their employer. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So it, it's it's likely because obviously this is a pre apprenticeship program, so you're going to have them go through the pre apprenticeship before they even get placed into the apprenticeship. It's mm -hmm. likely that they may not complete the apprenticeship during our 18 month time frame, and that's fine. That's that's allowable. That's not a negative against your organization. But if they do complete the program during the 18 months, that's when you'll enter that completion. And it all should be rap, uh, matching what's in the RAPIDS database, uh, which is where the data is collected for USDOL. Right. OK, great. Thank you. No problem. And this is the page, just so you know. And it's it's this last column for the completion date where you'll enter that. And you'll Perfect. choose the status of the apprentice uh, with USDOL as completed. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you so no, much. No problem. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, this is Shana Jarvis from Aspire in Burlington County. Um, for the quality partnership page, okay. do we only add a partner once one of our participants is going to be starting a job or training or an apprenticeship with them, or should we start adding them? as we're developing them. So it's really up to you. I would say it doesn't make sense for you to list them as quality partners until you start placing people with them, mainly because they're going to show up in the drop downs on the quality placement page. And if they don't actually have any placements, it just kind of makes it harder to make sure that you're choosing the right ones. Um, 
but it never hurts. We have plenty of organizations that will enter their all of their quality partners before they've even added participants, and that's allowable. There's no wrong way to do this. It really mm -hmm. comes down to what makes your job easier, and that's what I would suggest is do it whatever way works best for you and your organization. If putting them in up front is the better way, then that's great. If you don't want to put them in until you know they're truly a quality partner, because until you play somebody with them, they're really not a quality partner. You know what I mean? Um, so, uh, you know, that it really depends on which way works better for you. OK, got it. Thank you. Bill, will we um, get a copy of the presentation as usual or yep. the video recording? Yep, we'll, we'll do both. So you'll get the PowerPoint of the presentation. You'll get the user guides uh, PowerPoint as well. And we'll send you a recording of this uh, presentation once we can get it uploaded to our YouTube page. So you'll probably get all that within the next 24 to 48 hours, I would imagine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Still nothing in the chat, right, Lauren? I just want to make sure that we don't miss anything there. No, there's nothing. OK, so with that, I want to thank everybody for participating in today. I want to congratulate you all on the hard work that goes into submitting an application and getting approved. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm just being hard on you and making you do things on a on our schedule and we we highly appreciate the work that's and the effort that's put into submitting these types of applications and um, we look forward to working closely with each of you in making your program successful and leading these participants into uh, registered apprenticeship programs that are going to be successful and helpful to both them and the employers that are out there looking to kind of fill needs because you know all of us have been somewhere where somebody says I just can't get qualified workers anymore well these types of programs are what make those qualified workers exist um, you know we can't nobody's qualified uh, day one walking in at any job I don't care how much experience you had prior to the to taking that job. There's still a, a, a training period and the goal of our programs, the pre-apprenticeship programs specifically, are for you to prepare them to go into those registered apprenticeship programs or to go into those jobs that those employers are looking to fill so that when they get there, they're as prepared as they can be and the job then is the as the employers or that registered apprenticeship sponsors to ensure that those participants are, um, are, are going to be a, a good fit and that they can meet the overarching demands of that job. So um, we look forward to to all the hard work that we're all going to do together here in the next 18 months. Uh, if there's ever a time that you need help from us for anything, whether it has to do with our programs or not, please feel free to reach out to us. We don't mind helping or answering any questions. Um, and from that, if there's nothing else from any of you, thank you all. There is a, great. Bill, there, Bill, there's uh -oh, a question. What do we got? Is there an overall list of grantee organizations in case we get applicants who are outside of Hunterdon County but are interested in enrolling? We will create a directory. I don't know if it's already been created or not. It might have been. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's been created, we'll include the directory for all of our um, uh, for the programs that exist right now, um, she can provide you with the Lauren will provide you with the the pace um, directory uh, if you want it. So reach out to us and, and we'll send we'll send it to you because we have directories for this fiscal year round too, but we also have them for any active grants that we have going on right now. So she'll send you the directory for this fiscal year round two with all the other stuff that she sends out in the next 24 to 48 hours. But if you have an interest in getting the other information, whether it be PACE recipients, GAINS recipients, we have directories for all of our grants. Um, let us know and we can shoot them out to you. I just don't want to send out 25 things to everybody if not everybody wants it. Okay. Anything else? How about you, Lauren, Al, Heather, anybody have anything they want to add? 
maybe just a housekeeping tip that um, the email address, the um, DOL apprenticeship email address, please utilize that when um, reaching out for questions and such. But please, um, most of you have multiple programs, <laughs> another PACE program or even YTTW or GAINS. Please just specify which grant um, you're referring to when you do reach out to us for questions. It kind of helps that we could go directly <laughs> to the actual um, grant you're, you're questioning and not search all of your your grants and or have to reach back out and say which program are you referring to? So that's that's all. Oh, very, very good tip because like she said, for any of you who are recipients of previous PACE grants, GAINS grants, YTTW grants, we have all of them here in this one room right now. <laughs> um, it, it is always helpful for us to know who, who and what you're re, uh, referencing. Um, and that, that's helpful for you as well to use the apprenticeship unit email address because it comes to all of us, so you don't have to remember which one to reach out to. Uh, <laughs> you know, for uh, the good thing is we are redirecting things a little bit in the unit to where all of our pre-apprenticeship programs will be reporting to, to Lauren, so that would be YTTW and PACE, and all of our apprenticeship programs, our registered apprenticeship programs, our GAIN program, GAINS program specifically, is reporting to, uh, to Al. We have a NJ PLACE program as, as well, but it's a couple years old at this point. Um, that also reports to Al. So that'll be the way things go moving forward. But um, like I said, use the apprenticeship unit email address and we can all see it at the same time. So with that, if there aren't any other questions, I don't see any hands raised or any additional things put in the chat. Thank you all so much for being here uh, participating today. Um, I'm glad it looks like all of you have gotten your technology issues in line with all the craziness in the last week or so with the Microsoft issues. I know we had the issues. We still have people in our building that have issues and or through the one stop system. So hopefully none of you are dealing with all that craziness. But um, at the end of the day, like I said, if there's ever a time that we could be of assistance to you, please feel free to reach out. And we look forward to seeing your first reports here started up in the next couple all oh, next week and a week, right? I guess we're we're pretty much eight days out from when you can start. So uh, when we get to that point, we'll we'll start reaching out and, and talking to you about what you submit. All right. But otherwise, uh, everybody have a great rest of your summer. And if we if you need us, let us know. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.